Hello, I'm Shirai Satoko. It is a great pleasure for me to be here and share with you some of the findings from my fieldwork in the Ndrapa language. Here are the contents of this talk. First, I provide some basic information about the language, geography, and culture of the Ndrapa people. Next, I will profile features of the Ndrapa language. The last section will discuss some of the distinctive linguistic phenomena. In this talk, I will focus on the directional prefixes and related phenomena. Okay, the first part is language and people. Japa is spoken in these mountainous areas where steep mountains and deep valleys meet. It is located in the western part of Sichuan province, China. Japa is a Tibetan term for the people who speak this language. In Chinese, it is termed Japa, pronounced as Japa in Sutra Mandarin. In their old name, the people is referred to as Japi and the language is called Ndrake. Japa is one of the Tibeto-Burman languages which belong to the Sino-Tibetan language family. A number of languages with similar typological features are distributed in the vicinity of Japa, forming a language area. We call the area as the Chiangik language area or the Western Sutran ethnic corridor. These languages are also hypothesized to form a genetic branch called Chiangik. In particular, genetic relationships are being established for the Garongik group of languages indicated with the blue triangles. The Chiangik language area is located at the eastern end of the Tibetosphere or the Tibetan cultural area. The Chiangik languages are surrounded by three major languages with a written tradition and numerous speakers, that is, Chinese dialects, Tibetan or Tibetic languages, and Yi or Loloish languages. Japa is one of such minor languages. And in this area, villages are scattered among steep mountain valleys. And so they themselves say each village has its own lect. According to preceding studies, approximately 10,000 people speak Japa as their first language. There is no writing system or traditional writing in this language. Tibetan has been the traditional lingua franca in this area, and Chinese is now the predominant language. So, Japa has been under the strong influence of these languages. Dialectal differences exist even in this small language, and it is considered that there are three dialect groups, Northern, Southern, and Central. In this talk, I will use data from my fieldwork on the Metro dialect, the most Northern variety. Japa people live in stone houses as seen in these pictures. They are known for their matrilineal society with so-called walking marriages. They live by cultivating a small field, raising a few livestock, and gathering wild vegetables. Men often go to distant towns to work. 
This is a traditional kitchen. They sit on a wooden floor and they have a big hearth in their kitchen. Okay, I hope you're interested in them. Then let's move on to the linguistic part. Phonology. This slide shows the inventory of consonants and vowels. In addition to these basic segments, we can find prenasalized consonants, for example, belly, all, or pay, ice, and so on. Preaspirated consonants, such as ab, to learn, top, to carry, and so on, and other consonant clusters. Rapa has word tones, that is, distinctive pitch patterns that are carried by phonological words. They are categorized into four tones according to the pitch pattern of the first two syllables, high level, uh, which is realized as high high of uh, the first two syllables. Second is high falling, high falling and realized as an high and low of first two syllables. Third, low rising, uh, that is low high in the first two syllables uh, and low rising falling which is realized as rising and low of the first two syllables and the rest syllables are uh, realized as low however the lexical tone may be overridden by the intonation or post lexical prosody of the topic or focus. For example, the word for teacher is gege. So this is a plain pattern. Lexically, this word has tone three, low rising tone. However, it, when it comes to the topic position, it may be pronounced as gege, as high high or it is focused on, when, if it is focused on, it can be uh, said as geg, uh, as tone four, rising and low. From a viewpoint of morphological typology, Drapa mostly shows agglutinative features. It employs both prefixes and suffixes. For example, Verbs can take a directive prefix, a negative prefix, an aspectual suffix, and so on. In this example, doti and chingamoksha, this means uh, nothing other than the hot ash have remained. And uh, actually, it means everything has lost. In this case, uh, the word stem is uh, uh, remain. And two prefixes are attached uh, before the, the stem, ng, uh, outward directive, m, the negative, and um, a, pref a suffix. A suffix is attached here, a is a factual and perfective suffix. Adjective stems can be reduplicated productively and form nominalizations. That is, adjective stems have verbal features since they can take verbal affixes, but the reduplicated adjectives show nominal features, such as being an argument of a sentence. For example, zo is the stem uh, that means uh, be sour. And this stem can be can can have verbal affixes such as oza. Uh, this means uh, it has become sour or it has rotten. And, and upward directive prefix is attached, and the the, the, the perfective uh, 
suffix is also attached. These are verbal affixes. On the other hand, when it is reduplicated as zozo, uh, it is nominalized. So uh, it can take a classifier, noun classifier, uh, and it can, it can mean a sour one, something sour. Syntactically, it is a vowel final language. The basic constant order is SOV. Grammatical relations are indicated by case markers, and case markers are post nominal enclitics. So, for example, nga mitsu shishiro, this means I am parrying a cat, and uh, the Subject of transitive verb is not marked, just nga. And uh, the object is marked with wu, misu. However, uh, such uh, adjective, uh, accusative marker can be dropped if the grammatical relation is clear from the context. But in this case, uh, nga is not marked and the object misu is uh, marked with the accusative marker u, and then uh, uh, the verbal predicate comes. In the structure of a noun phrase, the head noun can be modified both from before and from after. So there are pre-head modifiers and post-head modifiers. Pre-head modifiers include demonstratives, nouns, and nominalizations, whereas post-head modifiers include adjectives in the reduplicated form and quantifiers. And this is an example of a noun phrase, made kimura choroi one ball that his mother gave him. So the head noun is this one, cholo, a ball. And a mother gave, me the ki, this is nominalized with the suffix me and genitive is attached to this um, Add a nominal clause, or maybe this is similar to the so called relative clause. And this is a, a verbal based nominalization, and it modifies uh, the head noun, head noun uh, before, uh, the, before the, the head noun, and then head noun comes, and after the head noun, e classifier is attached. And in this case, uh, this classifier means one. Uh, so this is uh, one of the quantifiers. And uh, this, is, uh, this means one ball, one ball uh, in choroi, uh, that his mother gave, uh, me the kimura. There are number of sentence final particles for mood and modality, uh, like many other East Asian languages have. For example, te is for hearsay, pa is for inferential, mo for confirmative, uh, re is for factual or allophoric, a or ra for double H question, me or me for polar questions, sa for admirative, and so on. So, for example, when they say it is raining, the form with no sentence final particle is used. For example, mok atere, it is raining. This pattern is used if the speaker directly knows the fact, but if uh, the speaker learns about it from someone else. Uh, for example, his, his friend said that uh, it's raining and I, I, uh, he, he knows, he now knows it's raining. Uh, then he, he, say, he says, 
the last day is the hearsay sentence final particle. Uh, and so this means uh, it, it's raining, but implies that they say it's raining or I heard it's raining. Okay, now let's talk about some linguistic topics. Here, I'd like to focus on directional prefixes and related phenomena. First, please take a look at this example. Uh, this is a quote from the folklore. And the situation is like this. And a rich man and Uncle Tempa, uh, a very famous wise man, went out to do business with a lot of grain. And the next at night, they stayed at the temple. But on the next morning, they found the grain disappeared. But actually, it was Uncle Tempa's plan. Okay, then the servants of the rich man went everywhere outside the temple to look for the grain. This part, yopre no bi do to chare. Servants outside look for go and go. In this part, the verb cho, which means go, takes the prefix Okay, uh, in the next part, but Uncle Tempa went up into the temple and did something. Uh, this part, Uncle Tempa yo sa. This means uh, uh, Uncle Tempa knows everything. Genbe uh, kabi ochare. Temple inside. Uh, inside of temple, he went. In this, in this part, the verb uh, cho uh, go takes o prefix o a different prefix than the last part and then he went down to where the rich man was ho ngoro ngoro akutemba that akutemba gebudo achore as a rich man's place went uh, and uh, here cho the verb stem takes uh, a prefix a so uh, the, the verb verb takes different prefixes in accordance with the context or something like that okay these prefixes show the direction of movement uh, as now you know uh, they they lives in uh, the steep mountains and deep valleys and when they go upward the prefix o is attached and this prefix alternated to o in the previous example similarly uh, when they uh, go downward a uh, is attached before the the verb stem and this this vowel is not altered and uh, up, upstream or inward g is used and outward or downstream uh, ng is used and the prefix t indicates indefinite or neutral direction the next example is and in this example, Japi here denotes the, the Japa region. And the verb di takes the upward directional prefix. Since this sentence was uttered in the town of Stau, which is at a higher altitude than Japa. Japa is the origin of the movement, upward movement. Japa is lower and Stau is upper. And the directional prefix suggests the direction of movement. It is worth noting that the noun phrase Japi do not have a case marker. 
of course, in Japa, uh, in Japa, the nominative case marker is a zero form, so the subject, gara nyo nyo pa, uh, do not have uh, any case marker, uh, but in uh, Japi, the origin of movement uh, do not take any case marker. Actually, in Japa do not have proper case marker for the origin of movement or for uh, from in English, but they have uh, directional prefixes. So uh, they know the direction of movement and uh, they know which of uh, which of star or Japa is uh, located upper uh, position. So uh, they know whether it is uh, the origin or goal of uh, the movement. So if the verb implies a movement, uh, the directional prefixes indicate the direction of movement. So, uh, these verbs may take any of the directional prefixes to indicate the direction of movement. For example, uh, basic, basic and movement verbs were run, flow, please, push, or arrive. Then, what about verbs that can't seem to choose a direction? For example, to eat or to die. They also take one of the directional prefixes, but the connection is fixed. Most verbs are associated, lexically associated, with only one of the directional prefixes. Such directional prefixes are obligatory in the perfective and the imperative. For example, kotsu. Uh, kotsu is uh, eat it, uh, the imperative. And uh, the, this inward directional prefix is obligatory in this case, uh, before the word uh, eat. Tsu. And, for example, me to shanda asoare. Asoa. Sorry. The mother told the children what they should do later before she died. In this case, uh, the verb sh uh, takes the neutral directional prefix and so order or told and takes the downward and directional prefixes. These are fixed connections. So, for example, it cannot take, for example, downward the directional prefix, or die cannot take the, the for example, upward directional prefixes. It is fixed in this language. Some semantic shifts are found on the directional prefixes, especially on the outward directional prefix ng. We consider this was originally uh, the outward uh, directional prefix. For example, ngki, give birth or to be born, can take this uh, prefix only. This is a, a lexically fixed uh, connection. And this is also used for the downstream movement. So, for example, ngani means a gentle breeze blows from upstream to downstream. Uh, toward downstream, so the uh, prefix ng is used. Since this uh, verb stem, a breeze blows, uh, li is uh, one of the movement verbs, so uh, it can choose any of the directional prefixes in accordance uh, with the, the direction of movement uh, or blowing. So, uh, if they say kali, uh, it means a breeze blows from downstream to upstream. K uh, is inward and upstream directional prefix. 
However, for uh, a strong wind like a storm, uh, only uh, the outward directional prefix is used. Ngachi, uh, a strong wind blows. This uh, verb cannot choose the the directional prefix. So this is not directive, but this implies uh, something drastic, drastic movement or drastic event. Uh, nga is often found with such um, such uh, verbs implies a drastic change or drastic event. Finally, I'd like to point out the aerial features. Having a set of directional prefixes is one of the aerial features shared by the languages of the Changik language area. In the Changik languages, a directive marker can fall into the pre-verbal slot of motion or orientational verbs according to their direction of motion. However, other features vary among languages. For example, Drapa shows the feature that the it, it is obligatory in perfective and imperative, and semantic shift from outward to drastic. But uh, this is, uh, these features are different in other languages. These are references and more references. Lastly, I'd like to thank the consultants who taught me the Ndrapa language. Thank you all for listening to the end. Aka, thank you, Ndrapa.